Good afternoon and welcome to our medical lecture series. I'm Dr. Galen Hakim, Assistant Vice President of International Healthcare Partnerships and Insurance Development at Baptist Health International. It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this informative presentation. I would like to extend warm greetings to our friends across Latin America, the Caribbean, and everyone joining us today. This afternoon, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Romero Rada with his presentation titled Cancer Rehabilitation, focusing on function throughout cancer journey. Dr. Rorada is a board certified phys physical medicine and rehabilitation physician at Baptist Health Miami Cancer Institute. He specializes in the rehabilitation of patients who have impairment related to cancer or its treatments. This includes musculoskeletal disorders, neuropathy, weakness, gait difficulty, balance problems, spasticity, contracture, difficulty swallowing, lymphedema, among other conditions. Dr. Orada earned his uh, degree of osteopathic medicine at the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in, Me in Virginia. He attended Eastern Virginia Medical School, where he did his residency, and he completed it uh, with uh, a specialty in physical medicine and rehabilitation. And then he was named the chief resident of the year in that particular school. He completed his Cancer Rehabilitation Fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Alliance uh, in New York City, where he served as a co-investigator for a case series of breast lymphedema. He's also a frequent speaker and lecturer on topics related to cancer rehabilitation. Dr. Rorada joined Miami Cancer Institute uh, from the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in Pittsburgh, where he served as an assistant professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. He works with multidisciplinary teams and uses treatments like non-opioid medications, target therapy, exercises, and prescriptions related to those type of therapies, therapeutic injections, bracing orthotics, among many other techniques. Dr. Orada is a member of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, in the Association of Academic Physiatrists in the American Osteopathic Association. Please, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Romer Rorada. Dr. Rorada, what a pleasure having you with us today. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation to do this very important talk and a different perspective of medicine, focusing on function in cancer patients. My name is Romer Arada, and I am a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician with a subspecialty in cancer rehabilitation, and I work in Miami Cancer Institute. For this talk, I have nothing to um, disclose. So for the next um, 20 to 30 minutes, um, these are our objectives. I will review the cancer patient population and survivor um, statistics, uh, discuss the gap in rehabilitation care in cancer patients. I will outline my, my subspecialty, um, which is cancer rehabilitation and highlight model of rehabilitation in the continuum of cancer care and um, finish that off with providing some examples of impairments in breast cancer with case presentations. As of 2022, um, the data from the um, WHO, there were close to more than about 20 million um, new cases that, that was diagnosed, um, close to 10 million cancer-related deaths, and more than 50 million um, five-year prevalent cancer cases in the world. Um, in 2022 data as well from the WHO, there were more than 1.5 million new cases diagnosed about 750,000 um, cancer-related deaths and more than 4 million uh, five-year prevalent um, cancer cases in Latin America and Caribbean countries combined. Uh, this table shows the world's cancer epidemiology. I'm not going into the specifics, but we'll um, highlight, really note the, uh, the top three leading um, causes of cancer in the world. Uh, as you can see, males, lungs, the most prevalent, prostate, colorectal, females, uh, breast, lung, and colorectal, and for combined sexes, uh, lung, followed by breast and colorectal. In 2024, this year, 
a little over 2 million new cancer cases are expected to be diagnosed in the United States. Uh, prostate cancer is by far the most common cancer among males, which comprises 29%, followed by lung um, and colorectal. In females in the United States, breast is by far the most common, which comprises about 32% of new incidents, projective incidents this year, followed by lung and colorectal. This slide shows the trends in cancer death rates by sex, again, in the United States. Uh, the cancer death rate um, in males and females combined has steadily declined by 33% since its peak in 1991. This table shows the five-year relative survival rate by cancer site. Uh, there have been um, notable improvements in survival for most cancer types due to earlier detection and advances in treatments. Overall, cancer survival has increased from 49% uh, percent, um, back in the 1970s to now 69% um, here in the United States. But we'll look at the, the breast um, uh, in terms of the, the female, the most common uh, cancer in females in the United States, the five-year relative survival now has approached more than 90%. Um, and for uh, prostate, the five-year relative survival now um, at 97%. Increased survivals means more survivors, and that means cancer is now becoming a chronic disease. As many as 20% of childhood and 53% of adult cancer survivors have re reported limitation in their functioning. And I think that's a low estimate. We know that impairments and symptoms can decrease function, quality of life, and work capacity. But despite the amount of cancer-related impairment, referral rates for even the most simple and treatable physical impairments were only reported to be as low as 1-2% although we are changing that. So what is the definition of a survivor? According to the National Cancer Institute, um, their definition is that um, it is a individual or one who remains alive and continues to function during and after overcoming a serious hardship or life-threatening disease. In cancer, a person is considered to be a survivor from the time of diagnosis until the end of life. And there are so many things that we have to think about for survivors. For long-term um, survivorship, you know, patients may experience long-term toxicities from the treatments, and that can potentially impact their functional status and quality of life. And the definition of cancer rehabilitation is as, as outlined. It is a medical care that should be well integrated throughout the oncology care continuum and delivered by trained rehabilitation professionals who have it within their scope of practice to diagnose and treat patients' physical, psychological, and cognitive impairments in an effort to maintain or restore function, reduce symptom burden, maximize independence, and improve quality of life in this medically complex population. So what is a role of a cancer physiatrist? What is my role? Really, the focus is on the evaluation and treatment of any functional loss and pain disorders. I do a comprehensive medical and functional assessment. I take a look at the cancer history, the initial diagnosis, any completed or any ongoing treatments, which include surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or immunotherapy. Um, because of that, that's important to provide precautions, you know, for example, weight bearing status and spinal stability. I also do a comprehensive medical review, which is necessary to evaluate for drug related side effects that could potentially impair patients. Um, we can also identify uh, potential drug effects, um, drug interactions um, by doing that. I review the specific needs for um, testing, for example, you know, do they need imaging, an x-ray, advanced imaging like MRI, or do they need specialized testing like nerve connection study or EMG, um, lab works, et cetera. And I will also determine um, referrals to subspecialty, for example, radiation um, or any surgical subspecialties if needed. And really, you know, the, the treatment 
um, it's really focusing on um, the function of the patient. Um, do I need to write a medication for them to improve their function? Any orthotics or braces? Um, any proper assistive devices, um, prescription like a cane or a walker? Um, do they need any therapeutic injections, et cetera? And of course, guiding physical therapy as well as occupational therapy and speech therapy um, is important to guiding um, patients um, with their treatment. Really, the goal is um, simple to restore maximal function and improve um, quality of life in patients. And this really involves a interdisciplinary approach. So now, what should be the model? What is the model of rehabilitation in cancer um, in the continuum of cancer care? Um, well, as I mentioned before, it should be well integrated throughout the cancer um, journey of the patient. And this is where we are spending our energy national and international efforts are being made to integrate cancer rehab throughout the cancer care. Um, and this is not a new concept. Uh, the DEETS classification requires four stages. Uh, DEETS, Dr. DEETS, so as you, um, used to be a um, uh, surgical oncologist at um, Memorial Sloan and was the first chief of uh, rehabilitation um, medicine back in the 1940s, 50s. And he came up with four different stages of rehabilitation in uh, patients diagnosed with um, cancer. Um, number one, preventative, trying to intervene early on in anticipation of potential impairment. So even at diagnosis, if there's any impairment, ideally we try to help with the, help the patient uh, with that impairment prior to um, the treatment. Restorative, trying to return the patient to a pre-morbid status. Supportive, uh, supporting patients throughout the decline. Um, palliative, um, assisting um, patient um, symptoms to control um, their symptoms and preventing complication. As you can see from this diagram, rehabilitation should be well integrated in the continuum of care from diagnosis throughout active treatment all the way to survivorship and even towards the end of life. So what's the reason the epidemiology of, of breast cancer here, I'm just I'm sharing some data, um, more than 300,000 women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in the United States. Again, that's from the 2024 projected uh, data. Um, as of 2022, 20, uh, there have been more than 200 a thousand women were diagnosed with breast cancer in the Caribbean and Latin countries, and more than 2.2 million women were diagnosed with breast cancer in the world um, back in, you know, from the 2022 uh, data. And more than 3 million Americans are alive with a history of breast cancer. So what is the rationale for rehabilitation in breast cancer, right? Um, again, just highlighting the five-year relative survival of patients with diagnosis of breast cancer now have approached more than 90%. And the five-year relative survival, that's regardless of the stage, you know, stage one to stage four metastatic disease. That means 91% of patients are alive five years out since their initial diagnosis. So what's the rationale for rehab in breast cancer? We know that physical and psycholog psychological side effects of breast cancer treatments impact function and quality of life. And as many as two thirds of breast cancer survivors experience one or more long-term long side effects from treatment. For example, the presence of one single um, impairment like lymphedema was found to increase overall healthcare utilization by 30% up to 10 years after um, all the treatments has ceased. And here are some of the specific impairments in breast cancer. Okay. Um, we're gonna go through some specific cases, um, highlighting um, the, the bullet points um, in red. I'm not gonna go into, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into um, cognitive dysfunction and fatigue, but know that cognitive dysfunction is very commonly reported um, symptom by, pa uh, by patients with cancer during and up to several years after treatment, treatment um, and mostly attention and memory dysfunction are common. And fatigue, nearly all patients experience fatigue and up to a third 
of patient endure fatigue <clears throat> even years after um, cessation of treatment. So here's our first case. We have a 38-year-old female with a diagnosis of bilateral breast cancer. I'm not going to go into the details of the, of the, the pathology of the cancer, but the patient underwent left modified radical mastectomy with axial lymph node dissection. Five of 16 lymph nodes came back positive. And on the right side, she had total mastectomy with simple lymph node biopsy. Um, uh, one lymph node with sample that was negative. And, you know, the surgery happened after the patient received me adjuvant um, treatment with um, the chemo listed. Um, when I saw the patient, uh, she's undergoing uh, post uh, mastectomy radiation. And when by the time I saw the patient, um, she had um, about seven uh, fractions of the 12, 25 um, fractions planned to her left chest wall and axilla. And the patient was referred to, to us, to me, for left arm squat. So lymphedema. Uh, prospective studies, um, lymphedema occurs after um, the following uh, procedures. For syndrome of lymph node biopsy, you know, it occurs, you know, between zero to 7%, so it might never occur, but depending on, again, how many lymph nodes were sampled, um, if there's, uh, a requirement to remove more lymph nodes, actual lymph node dissection. Now that risk goes up to about 15 to 20 percent. Uh, radiation alone to the axilla, the risk for developing lymphedema is about five to 15 percent. But if you combine um, axillary surgery, any axillary surgery with radiation, now the risk of lymphedema on that effective um, limb can go up to about 25 to 40 percent. We know that random um, controlled trial um, detected uh, significantly lower rates of breast cancer-related um, lymphedema with proper education and exercise when compared with education alone after completion of axillary dissection. And a 10-year follow-up study shows that patients have a better long-term outcomes with diagnosed with low-volume um, early lymphedema. Uh, patients. Um, ideally, patients to undergo axillary lymph node dissection or any axillary radiation, they could uh, benefit from um, early rehabilitation, a referral to discuss really the risk factors, discuss the role of exercise, symptom management, and how to reduce the, the risk factors. Um, uh, as a level one evidence that resistive exercise in both survivors with and or um, and uh, those patients at risk for lymphedema, um, that's, uh, that's something that we're educating patients on. Um, also, that you know, randomized controlled trials have shown that survivals who will participate in progressive resistance exercise program have fewer and less severe lymphedema exacerbation. Um, and really, the standard of care of lymphedema treatment is complex reconjective therapy, which involves manual lymph um, lymphatic drainage, um, wrapping and compression um, garments. Next case, we have a 44-year-old female uh, with a diagnosis of triple negative right-sided breast cancer. Um, she underwent knee adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, four cycles of um, andromycin cyclophosphamide, and 12 weeks of weekly paclitaxel and um, cover platinum. And after that, she underwent bilateral total mastectomy with right-sided central and lymph node biopsy. One out of the three lymph nodes came back positive, so she underwent radiation to the to um, to the supraclavicular, axillary, and right chest wall. And then she um, was initiated on adjuvant chemotherapy with Cape Cytidine or Siloda. And the patient had a plan to have construction surgery later on this year. And the patient was referred to, to me for hand and feet numbness and paresthesia. So chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. And it's estimated that 30 to 40 percent treated with chemotherapy will experience um, CIPN. Uh, most commonly, it is a sensory neuropathy and can manifest by numbness, 
tingling sensation, as well as shooting and burning pains and a stocking blood distribution. It can make patients unsteady on their feet. You know, they're prone to, to falling and unable to feel the hand, um, feel their hand. So that can affect the way they um, hold things and they're prone to dropping things. And fall risk is very high. It's two to three times greater in patients with a history of receiving <clears throat> neurotoxic uh, chemotherapeutic um, agents. Uh, treatment for acute or chronic CIPN is difficult. You know, this best established agent that we have, um, at least here in the United States, loxetine or Cymbalta, only um, able to decrease neuropathic pain to a modest degree. Um, there's really no treatment, no remedy for chronic anesthesia or numbness or the rare motor neuropathy. Um, it is important to assess what activities are impaired in order to provide some strategies and tips and key for safety and quality of life um, is important. Training for gait efficiency and for prevention is beneficial and assistive devices can really optimize safety and uh, the patient's uh, function. So next case, we have a 65-year-old female diagnosed with left breast ductal carcinoma in situ uh, uh, cancer, and the patient went um, underwent segmental uh, mastectomy or lumpectomy, followed by two and a half years of taking tamoxifen, but it was discharged to um, discontinued due to weight gain, and also the patient had full breast irradiation. Now the patient developed intraductal um, carcinoma um, of the left breast. Uh, the patient underwent a bilateral total mastectomy with central lymph node biopsy on the left side. Zero out of four lymph nodes um, showed um, a negative of malignancy. Um, post op, she developed superficial chest walls and ulitis, requiring replacement of a drain and IV antibiotics. Um, and, um, you know, being hospitalized and eventually, um, you know, the treatment um, worked for her and then she completed a driven um, chemotherapy, um, AC with four cycles and weekly um, taxol for about 12 weeks. And the patient was referred to, to me uh, for cancer-related pain um, and ongoing bilateral shoulder range of motion limitation. So loss of shoulder range of motion with or without pain affects up to 50% of breast cancer survivors with about 15% experiencing severe restriction that can really impair their function. So for rotator cuff tendinopathy, the differential is broad, right? And really for, for patients without diagnosis of breast cancer, this is what we think about. But when there's a history of cancer, especially breast cancer, now the differential diagnosis um, for any shoulder limitation now is um, even more significant because you have to worry about recurrence, metastasis to the area, um, et cetera, in addition to the commonly uh, seen um, shoulder um, dysfunction and ideology of limitation and pain. So rotator cuff dysfunction um, really causes abnormal range of motion with or without pain. Uh, there are extrinsic and intrinsic etiology. Extrinsic meaning impingement of the tendon due to degenerative joint disease. Intrinsic degeneration of or, or tears into the tendons. And anything really that causes excessive stretch in the tendons, glenohumerals, instability and loss of abnormal scapular mobility can impact um, the way uh, the shoulder um, is moved both actively and passively by the patient. Management for this activity modification is important to reduce risk <clears throat> of further injury, therapy, physical therapy to address abnormal kin kinetic chain. Um, the goal is to achieve pain-free range of motion to normalize the scapular humeral rhythm. Um, the, the rotator cuff um, muscles need to be strengthened. Um, Activity-specific training is important, and local injection and or systemic inflammatories is um, important um, as well to help um, uh, patients, especially with, with pain. 
Um, adhesive capsulitis, it is a painful shoulder restriction. 10% uh, of breast cancer survivors um, develop adhesive capsulitis at some point. Um, really, the risk factor for for our, the breast uh, patient, breast cancer patient population is prolonged immobilization um, because of the surgery and or radiation. Management, uh, pain control with NSAIDs, uh, therapy, um, initial range of motion should be gentle and perform until pain-free art. And then to be, you know, if you go more to uh, being aggressive with the range of motion, then strength training and task specific. Uh, for patient that continues to have um, pain, glenohumeral joint injection, um, ideally with um, ultrasound guidance is beneficial. <clears throat> Next case, we have a 69-year-old female with left-sided invasive lobular carcinoma, and she underwent um, left total mastectomy with left axial lymph node dissection. Three out of 11 lymph nodes came back positive. So that was followed with post mastectomy uh, radiation therapy. Um, she was started on endocrine therapy, hormonal therapy, um, and she previously trialed and that's result in let result, but she self discontinued both due to the side effect profile, like arthrologists. And the patient is, um, was sent to me for chronic left chest wall and actually pain as well as joint pains. Um, upper quadrant pain, also known as uh, post-mastectomy pain syndrome. Um, you know, it has become clear that pain may occur after any breast or axillary surgery, not just after post-mastectomy. That's why it's changed to upper quadrant pain. Um, a large population-based study found that about 47% of breast cancer survivors endures persistent pain, even two to three years out after treatment um, and within the subgroup, um, 13 had severe um, limitation in pain. Um, it is important to, to find the etiology because it can be musculoskeletal, it could be neuropathic, it could be mechanical or a combination of all of the above. And treatment generally lacks, um, at this time, robust supportive evidence. Call analgesics, um, uh, nerve stabilizing agent like gabapentin may offer benefit. Uh, topical agents have weak evidentiary support but can also provide relief for the patient. Uh, physical modalities including manual drainage, uh, trigger point injections, exercise, and addressing the shoulder range um, shoulder range of motion may offer um, benefit um, as well. Aromatase inhibitor induce musculoskeletal symptoms. Uh, for patients with um, a diagnosis of breast cancer that are um, estrogen receptor positive, um, uh, typically patients are placed on aromatase inhibitors, uh, for example, anastrozole, exemestane, letrozole. Um, so musculoskeletal complaints is very common. Joint pains are very common. Um, that includes the, you know, arthrologists, you know, in the hands, in the knees, hips, um, low back, ankles, and feet are, are common. Uh, Tenosynovitis and joint effusion have been confirmed by imaging. And, um, you know, for example, the core of tenosynovitis, uh, trigger fingers, carpal tunnel syndrome are very common in these patients. So the core of tenosynovitis, it is really the inflammation, the first dorsal compartment of the wrist, which involves the extensor pollicis brevis and AB doctor pollicis longus. And um, imaging it does show. Um, some inflammation of fluid around the area causing um, pain um, to the first dorsal compartment. Uh, management for this, uh, typically what I use, um, a thumb spike splint to um, reduce the inflammation, keep it mobile for a little bit, um, certainly cryotherapy, um, any topical or oral NSAIDs have been helpful for patients, and occupational therapy, addressing abnormal kinetic chain, hand therapy, and exercises are important. And for those patients that continues to have um, pain, um, a local corticosteroid injection, ideally with um, ultrasound guidance, is uh, very beneficial. Carpal tunnel syndrome, um, the compression of um, median nerve in the carpal tunnel due to the tissinovitis of the finger flexor in the carpal tunnel. Um, and 
Um, just wanted to add this in. It really neat, you know, before the diagnosis of carpal tunnel or any of the pathologies we, we were talking about, we need to rule out any other concurrent neurological deficits, for example, in the cervical radiculopathy um, <clears throat> before the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, management, anti-inflammatories, splinting exercises, hand therapy is very helpful. Uh, nerve stabilizing um, agent uh, medications like gabapentin, Lyrica, Cymbalta has been um, shown to, to help. Um, injection um, to that area, um, any local um, <clears throat> anesthetic and or steroids can also be helpful. And for patients with uh, moderate to severe symptoms, uh, surgery, um, may be the last result. result. Trigger finger can be painful and debilitating disorder, significantly affecting hand function. Um, it presents with a finger that blocks inflection, requiring passive extension of the digit. Um, it is due to the tendon sheets and ability to glide under the A1 fully, again, because of tenosynovitis. Management, anti-inflammatories, um, trigger finger splints, hand therapy, uh, trigger point injections, trigger finger injections, um, and then again, last resort is surgery. Next case, we have a 35-year-old female diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer with widely diffused metastasis to the lungs and underwent radiation for that, and also in the bone, um, and the patient underwent multiple rounds of chemotherapy and immunotherapy as well as multiple clinical trials. A uh, patient was recently found to have pathologic fracture of L4, as well as intramedullary metastasis to T1 and T2 um, and T12 to L1, as well as leptomeningeal spread. Uh, the patient was seen by neuros neurosurgery and no surgical intervention was planned. Uh, the patient underwent radiation to T1, T4, as well as T12 to sacrum, um, 10 fractions total and the patient is about to start a new round of chemotherapy and immunotherapy. The patients referred to me for back pain and leg weakness. So for patients with spine metastasis, the goal of rehabilitation really is to aim to try to help relieve symptoms, improve the quality of life for the patients, enhance their functional um, independence, and to really prevent Further complications. We do this by education and spinal precautions for the patients, um, the use of any sp uh, spinal braces or spinal orthosis. I use um, a lot in my practice, uh, guiding physical therapy and occupational therapy uh, to try to, to protect the spine and keeping the muscles strong around it to help um, protect those fractures or the, the metastasis. Uh, nutritional assessment is um, important in these patients and assess the patient if they need, need any um, any um, devices like a, a cane, walker, wheelchair to um, to prevent um, complications like fall. And this is really the, you know, some of the, the braces that I use in my practice for patient um, with uh, spine metastasis and or pathological fracture that are non-surgical candidate. I use this TLSO, um, Spinomed. Sometimes I use a, a clavicle figure of eight brace to work on their posture to prevent slouching, um, to reduce risk for fractures in the future. Um, also use a lumbar sacral orthosis. Again, the, the goal is to help stabilize the spine and provide um, relief for the patient. So the take home message really is rehabilitation, especially in cancer patients are safe, you know, but it is important that um, to know that there are so many considerations that we have to um, take into account um, in this unique population, the cancer history, where are they in the cancer diagnosis, what treatments they've had, that they have surgery, that they have radiation, that they have chemotherapy and their therapy. Right? Where are they? Are they? Um, where are they in, in terms of their their cancer diagnosis? Um, we know that rehabilitation provides therapeutic invention that may not only helps with symptom management but also help mitigate loss of function and disability in cancer survivors. 
So in conclusions, you know, there are multiple medical and functional impairments for patients with diagnosis of cancer and or survivors. You saw that from um, the lecture today, um, just focusing on breast cancer, some of the common things that I see um, in my practice. You know, impairments can be as simple as trigger finger because of a um, potential tenosynovitis from a um, aromatase inhibitor, or it can be substantial. Uh, for example, this um, patient that I've had, um, you know, patient with a um, diagnosis of sacral chordoma and the patient underwent um, resection to um, L4 and L5 as well as um, complete sacroiectomy and complete <clears throat> and complete um, sacrifice of L4, L5. And you can only imagine um, uh, L4, L5 below, you can only imagine the impairment the patient has. Um, you know, treating patients with the cancer diagnosis, especially in their function and rehabilitation can be challenging, but also very rewarding field. Um, you know, it is a dynamic, cancer is a dynamic disease, but it is a very rewarding field. The goal is really simple for the patient. Um, we need to be objective, we have to be realistic and provide um, goals that um, can be attainable uh, despite the medical diagnosis. Okay. And with that, um, I conclude my talk. Again, thank you for the um, invitation for me to be um, uh, to be with you, and I will be available for for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Arada, for that incredible presentation. On behalf of our entire team at Baptist International, thank you. And thank you all for participating in today in today's lecture. If you have additional questions about today's presentation, please feel free to email them to bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. That is bhiwebinars at baptisthealth.net. We'll make sure to forward those questions to Dr. Rala for him to respond and send them back to you. We look forward to seeing you at our next uh, medical lecture series, which is scheduled for May 22nd, 2024. Thank you once again and have a phenomenal afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Orada.